Hello, this is the Gemsbok, and today's topic is Crypt of the Necrodancer, a game developed by Brace Yourself Games and originally released in 2015. Crypt of the Necrodancer is a 2D, top-down, rhythm-based roguelike. That is, in the spirit of games like Rogue and NetHack, it's got permadeath, randomized levels and items, high difficulty, dungeon exploration in an initially darkened map, and grid-based movement. Yet, in the spirit of rhythm games like Dance Dance Revolution and Parappa the Rapper, it's also got a player character and a set of enemies that can only move or act in time with the beat of the game's music. Right off the bat, if you're anything like me, then you're wary of a genre mashup that seems on the surface to have most of its justification in being a quirky gimmick, rather than being a well-reasoned basis for gameplay. But after the many hours I've spent playing it, it has become clear that Necrodancer's genre mixture is its best attribute, is actually a very clever idea, and trivially ascends from being a potential gimmick into being a considered and well-implemented mechanical design. Nevertheless, I would actually be fairly reticent to recommend the game to the majority of players, and that fact has very little to do with it being a mix between two already niche styles. Much as I'd like to just go off singing its praises, preferably as a duet with the game's vocally gifted merchant NPC, it's not all peaches and cream. To explain why, I'll be dusting off the pro and con list structure I used previously to analyze Luftrausers. This one is likely to be a bit contentious further along, but just like in that previous video, let's first start with some positives. Interestingly, and somewhat unintuitively, the core mechanics of Crypt of the Necrodancer are closer to the forebears of the roguelike genre than many of its most prominent titles of the past decade, like Spelunky, FTL, and The Binding of Isaac. In addition to the procedural generation, permadeath, and punishing difficulty shared by so many roguelikes and roguelites, the movement in Necrodancer is grid-defined. The gameplay includes exploration of initially darkened subterranean dungeon maps, and the enemies act at the same pace as the player character. That last detail essentially retains the turn-based gameplay that those other modern takes on the roguelike formula largely abandon. The rhythm mechanics merely make it so that the enemies are not required to move because of the player character's movement, unless one plays as the character named Bard. Instead, they merely happen to move at the same pace that the player character does. As such, after you become familiar with the items and enemies, playing Crypt of the Necrodancer becomes an exciting balancing act between strategic decision-making and instinctive action. You're basically playing a strategy game with a sharply limited time to choose each move before that action is lost, making for an experience that is reminiscent of a much flashier version of speed chess. In light of this comparison, it seems somehow poetic that one of the bosses is a massive, aggressive chess set. The fact that it uses rhythm mechanics as a form of time pressure for player strategy is a big reason that I'm impressed by the game. It's a very effective way of keeping a player on their toes without explicitly telling them that they have to work fast or even against a timer. Elements like the ghost in Spelunky and the boss rush in Isaac also push players toward moving through those games at a brisk pace, but they can't quite keep the pressure on in the same way as the beat of Necrodancer. This is a blessing and a curse, of course, as it can often make it much more tiring to play Crypt of the Necrodancer for long periods of time than it is to play seemingly similar games. Now, admittedly, I don't personally seek out games in the rhythm genre. The only other rhythm games that I've played to completion are some of the Guitar Hero games and the rhythm-based indie RPG Before the Echo. Other than that, my entire interface with the genre is limited to loosely, or even just arguably, rhythm-based games I have liked, such as Bit Trip Runner, the WarioWare titles, and Super Hexagon. I have no considerable pass with DDR titles, or singing games, or elite beat agents, or audio surf, or beat saber, or osu. My interest in Necrodancer stemmed as much from the promise of a Danny Baranowski soundtrack as from the gameplay concepts on offer. But I have to admit that I've been blown away by the successful integration of these two apparently disparate genres. There is certainly nothing wrong with a mechanical choice that is simple or gimmicky, provided that, as I have previously discussed in my video on Super Crate Box, the execution is solid. Everything about the design of Crypt of the Necrodancer is informed by the rhythm of its songs. Not only are movement and action by players and enemies tied to the beat, but the different tempos of the songs in each level parallel the advances in difficulty throughout the game, including at least two elements that make use of irregular tempos for added challenge. The designs and behaviors of the enemies are fine-tuned for fast-paced, rhythmic interactions. All of their movements and attacks are simple and clearly legible, making the handling of a room full of enemies as much a task of prioritization as dexterity. All of the game's bosses are designed around, or 
in conjunction with their music, lending them personality while also making them quite memorable. The levels are perfectly sized to be fully cleared and explored, plus a return trip to the shop, with about enough time to reach the exit stairs before each song ends the level, though obviously faster strategies are very possible. And of course, the dancing sprites, the abundant musical puns, and the music-related narrative elements all do a reasonably good job of providing further justification for the genre combo. This simply does not feel like a roguelike with a rhythm game tacked on, nor vice versa. In addition to its strong core gameplay, Crypt of the Necrodancer offers a broad array of training modes, challenge runs, and other forms of gameplay variety and customization. To be specific, including the DLC, the ways that one can vary their experience of the game according to their preferences include a level editor, 14 playable characters with unique playstyles, different interchangeable soundtracks, the ability to add custom tracks in place of the game's stock music, the ability to play just one of any of the five primary zones, the ability to play the entire game in local co-op, support for keyboard, controller, and dance pad, fully rebindable inputs for all three control methods, and Steam Workshop support for mods. So, if you ever get tired of any aspect of the game as it is shipped, and you're willing to do a bit of tinkering, you can rest assured that there will be numerous alternatives available to you. Along these same lines, it's pretty remarkable just how much content is crammed into the game alongside its ostensible primary gameplay of repeatedly attempting to beat All Zones mode as the protagonist, Cadence. Again including DLC content, the game's main story sprawls out across cutscenes accompanying four characters, each with their own final boss encounters. Some of the characters can dramatically change how the game is played, including everything from a monk who must avoid all pieces of gold, to an explosives expert who attacks by lobbing bombs, to a pacifist character who literally cannot attack at all. And the practice areas surrounding the main menu are incredibly thorough, rivaling the kind of tools one would only expect to access through a developer debug menu or a speedrun training mod in another title. The way that Crypt of the Necrodancer allows its players to tear its mechanics apart and hone their skills with each tiny piece to their heart's content is very laudable and considerate in light of the high challenge level offered by the primary gameplay. In fact, in addition to this aspect of the game being worthy of considerable praise, it could have made Necrodancer one of the most welcoming roguelike derivatives of the past decade, if not for the next topic in this video. Unfortunately, Crypt of the Necrodancer is not without flaws, and the biggest flaw that it has is how the design of its campaign progression and difficulty both serve to undo many of the merits of the variety and customizability detailed in the previous section. First, the item unlock system, as well as the associated item head start and item culling systems, are entirely irrelevant to the all zones mode that very quickly becomes a player's primary focus and goal. This basically means that five of the nine rooms peppered around the main menu become obsolete within a matter of hours of starting the game. Perhaps if all zones mode was not so heavily emphasized as the true way to play the game by its achievements, daily runs, and training modes, these systems would feel less like they were being quickly thrown in the trash. Second, the gameplay challenges of Necrodancer's later bosses implement new mechanics that the player will never have seen until getting all the way there. While these fights are satisfying and fun after you get the hang of them, this state of affairs basically guarantees that no new player will be able to beat the game the first time that they battle their way to the final boss. This issue is combated somewhat by having those finales become unlocked for training after first being reached, but this feels like a patchwork solution at best. And since the final version of the game has six final boss fights spread across its four story characters, the experience of getting a run to the last boss in order to be immediately destroyed is one they're likely to be forced through at least six times, either making the later boss mechanics more intuitively readable or offering some kind of light tutorialization at or before the first encounter of them would have gone a long way toward mitigating this issue. Third, the final character in Crypt of the Necrodancer's primary string of story mode characters represents a jarring, staggering, unreasonable upward spike in difficulty that reveals a more far-reaching issue with the game's challenge design. So, you start the game as Cadence, who begins each run relatively weak in what is already quite a tough game, but has no special restrictions. You move on to Melody, who is given a fairly useful weapon that she has to use, but otherwise has no special restrictions either. Finally, you advance to Aria, who has half of a single heart of health, is restricted to the game's worst weapon, starts in the game's hardest area, cannot obtain additional health, and takes damage when a beat is missed. If she gets hit once, she dies. If the player drops a single beat, she dies. The restrictions on her weapon and health sum together to make nearly all of the game's items and shrines literally useless for her, leaving her with a tiny pool of mechanics to draw from. But you're given one revive potion though, so you get to make one small mistake, 
provided you immediately recover from it and are otherwise completely perfect. None of the stuff in this game is easy, mind you. Without armor, even a small mistake can already lead to death, and only 2.5% of players have beaten the game with Melody. But the share of players that have then gone on to beat the game with Aria is 0.5%. Without trying this out for yourself, it's hard to express what a mess it is. Imagine you're playing Super Mario World. You start off on Yoshi's Island, where you beat all of the levels. No problem. You move on to the Donut Plains, and again, you beat all of the levels, good stuff. You enter the Vanilla Dome, open up a level, and the game inexplicably becomes a Kaizo Mario ROM hack. Unlocking Aria in Crypt of the Necrodancer is kind of like that. Then you step back and consider all of the available characters, and you quickly realize that most of them are nearly at that level of difficulty, with a few being even harder. Including the DLC, there are 14 characters, but only 6 of them, less than half, have completion rates at or above 1% of players. And then you consider its other forms of customization, and you also notice that nearly all of those alternate ways of playing are ways of making the game harder, or more random, or longer. Even even seeming exceptions to this trend barely nudge the needle in the other direction, such as the slightly easier dance pad mode, which is explicitly labeled for a specific control scheme and ends immediately after the first zone, locking out all game progress. Now, speaking for myself, when it comes to games, I'm a mountain climber. I don't mind occasionally being shown a cliff and simply told to climb it. Some of the famously difficult games in which I have 100% completion on Steam include Spelunky, Dust Force, Space Chem, The Binding of Isaac Rebirth, Celeste, Slay the Spire, FTL, and Dark Souls. I'm not saying this is some kind of pointless brag. There are certainly people who are familiar with Crypt of the Necrodancer, but not familiar with me, who are likely to assume that I'm offering the criticism in this section because I personally find the game to be too challenging. In point of fact, I've personally unlocked all but one of the game's 14 characters, and I've beaten the game with nearly all of them. I've even seen the final ending cinematic from beating each individual zone as Arya, although I haven't beaten all zones mode with her. All I'm saying in this section is that I fully understand anyone who peers up at the wall of stone Necrodancer is passing off as a difficulty curve and chooses to just walk away instead. For a literal 99% of players to look at the list of the game's characters, in effect, its list of ways to play, and to see that the majority of those characters are completely inaccessible to them in terms of gameplay, can't feel good can't feel like the game is valuing them as players. Crypt of the Necrodancer simply features a very odd combination of design choices. There are extremely few games that have as many training and accessibility concessions as this one, that go to so much trouble to tutorialize every mechanic and area to such a significant degree, and yet little of that work on smoothing out the experience for most players seems to have been directed at the core gameplay. There are so many small things that could have been done to erode the game's jagged difficulty cliffs into something more like slopes that could more reasonably be climbed. Here's just a few ideas off the top of my head. Monk could take damage from touching gold instead of instantly dying. Mary could take damage from her lamb being hit instead of instantly dying. Tempo could accumulate more than 16 turns before instant death by getting kills on consecutive beats, or by maintaining a combo across 10 or more kills. There could be another tutorial character that bridges the gap between Bard and Cadence by always allowing a dropped beat to follow a hit beat without losing a combo. There could be a beginner character that recharges a one-hit shield after a certain number of perfect beats. Some characters could afford to have their starting stats buffed by a heart or two, and Arya could lose one or even two of her current set of restrictions in order to avoid feeling like such a ridiculous punch in the gut. I'm not saying that any of the game's current set of challenges need to be removed, just pushed back so they aren't visible until further into the experience, and even concealed to some degree so as to make them come across as explicitly optional extras. And no part of what this game presently offers among its most difficult characters belongs between the player and seeing the conclusion of the game's story. Just seeing the end of a story is not something that should be restricted to roughly one out of every 200 people that engage with the work. In light of its actual content, the game's enormous quantity of training features come across almost as a taunt or an apology, more so than a friendly gesture. As it stands, if you manage to obtain just 40% of the game's achievements, you're already in the 99th percentile of all players of Crypt of the Necrodancer on Steam. Before I close out here, I'd like to mention that there are some elements of Crypt of the Necrodancer that I didn't cover earlier because I consider them neither pros nor cons. The most notable of these relate to the game's aesthetics, including its art and music. As for the art, much as I have avowed an affinity for pixel art in the past, and much as the art in Necrodancer is very well made, I can't fight the feeling that the art assets in the game never cohere into a really interesting style in the same way as some of its indie pixel art contemporaries. And there are a lot of small visual elements that are noticeably unpolished. 
such as the game using the same visibly female body armor sprites regardless of character choice, and having no character animations for digging or attacking, so it instead just slaps the shovel or effect sprites on adjacent tiles. I should point out though that visual design is an area where Brace Yourself games have improved in the intervening years, or at least acquired new people for, as evidenced by the more cohesive and polished art in their more recent game, Cadence of Hyrule. And at any rate, regardless of what I think of the art itself, the animations that are in the game are great, very clear and understandable, while always keeping the entities dancing. As for the music, though it pains me to say it, one of the more disappointing aspects of the game for me personally is Danny Baranowski's soundtrack. And that's not really fair to say, because the music is quite good, and I do definitely enjoy it. The problem is just that it's very standard video game fare, and it most assuredly pales in comparison to the stellar atmospheric work he did for the original Binding of Isaac, and the tonally perfect in-your-face soundtrack he provided for Super Meat Boy. The individual level songs in Necrodancer tend to blur together, potentially because they all had to be so heavily and consistently beat driven, although admittedly several of the boss tracks are every bit as good as I was expecting the entire soundtrack to be. I say these aesthetic matters are neither pros nor cons for a few reasons. First, because they are perfectly serviceable, not incredible, but certainly not bad either. Second, because they're highly subjective. And third, because any perceived badness in them can be rectified through the extensive customization options detailed earlier. So in the final evaluation, I would maintain that Crypto the Necrodancer has two notable pros and one notable con. It is certainly a game whose virtues outweigh its flaws. And despite its imperfections, Crypto the Necrodancer is a fantastically fun game that I highly recommend to certain players. Crypt of the Necrodancer is very conceptually original, looks and sounds nice, and feels great when you're playing well. Add to that its high amount of content and high number of customizable features, and you've got a truly solid title. Still though, there are also plenty of people to whom I would not generally recommend the game, for whom the extensive customization and high quantity of content would almost seem like a fiction or a cruel joke. Newer players, younger players, more casual players, players who are averse to roguelikes or rhythm titles, players who are easily discouraged by losses and completion Ordinarily, I would be the first to encourage people to push themselves to try playing harder games or harder playstyles. But this game starts out very hard, ramps up to ridiculously hard, and then keeps climbing from there until some of its final challenges are not physically achievable for most players. The game doesn't pull a single punch and assumes that its players' tenacity will see them through, or else the various training features might have to. The execution and design of the game's combination of rhythm and roguelike mechanics is nothing short of impressive, and was, at least when it released, very unique. So if you're either a particularly tenacious player, a fiend for rhythm titles, or a less intense player who is explicitly unfazed by never being able to even touch most of the game's unlockable characters, then yeah, I recommend it. It's a lot of fun.